Chapter 12 Sleep overcame me, and when I awoke, Zulba had gone. It was cold, and I did not have the slightest desire to rise. I reached up to some bookshelves above my head, and took down a book which I had brought with me, and of which I was fond, the poems of M Malarmé. I read slowly, and... At random, I closed the book, opened it, opened it again, and finally threw it down. For the first time in my life, it all seemed bloodless, odorless, void of any human substance, pale blue hollow words in a vacuum, perfectly clear distilled water without any bacteria, but also without any nutritive substances, without life. In, religion which have lo in religions which have lost their creative spark, the gods eventually become no more than poetic motifs or, or, or ornaments for decorating human solitude and woes. Something similar had happened to this poetry. The ardent aspirations of the heart, laden with earth and seed, had become a flawless intellectual game, a clever aerial and intricate architecture. I reopened the book and began reading again. Why had those, these poems gripped me for so many years? Pure poetry. Life had turned into a lucid, transparent game, uh, unencumbered by even a single drop of blood. The human element is brutish, uncouth, impure. It is composed of love, the flesh, and the cry of distress. Let it be sublimated into an abstract idea, and, in the crucible of the spirit, by various processes of alchemy, let it be rarefied and evaporate. All these things which had formerly so fascinated me ap appeared this morning to be no more than cerebral ac ac acrobatics and refined charlatanisms. That is how it always is at the decline of a civilization. That is how man's anguish ends. Uh, in masterly con conjuring tricks, pure poetry, pure music, pure thought. The last man who had freed himself from all belief, from all illusions, and ha has nothing more to expect or to fear, sees the clay of which he is made reduced to spirit, and the, sp the spirit has no soil left for its roots from which to draw its sap. The last man has emptied himself, no more seed, no more excite uh, excrement, no more blood. Everything having turned into w words, e every set of words into musical jugglery, the last man goes even further. He sits in his utter solitude and decomposes the music into mute mathematical equations. I started. Buddha is that last man, I cried. That is his secret and terrible significance. Buddha is the pure soul, which has emptied itself. In him is the void. He is the void. Empty your body, empty your spirit, empty your heart, he cries. W wherever he sets his foot, water no long longer flows, no grass can grow, no child be born. <clears throat> I must m mobilize words and their ne necromantic power, I thought. Invoke magic rhythms, lay siege to him, cast a spell over him and drive him out of my entrails. I must throw over him the net of images, catch him and free myself. Writing Buddha was, in fact, ceasing to be a literary exercise. It was a life and death struggle against the tremendous force of destruction lurking within me, a duel with, with the great No, which was consuming my heart, and on the result of this duel depended the, the salvation of my soul. W uh, with briskness and, and determination I seized the manuscript. I had discovered my goal. I knew now where to strike. Buddha was the last man. We are only at the beginning. We have neither eaten, drunk, nor loved enough. We have not yet lived. This delicate old man, scant of breath, has come to us too soon. We must oust him as quickly as possible. So I spoke to myself and I began to write. But no, this was not writing. It was a real war. A, a merciless hunt, a siege, a spell to bring the monster out of its hiding place. Art is, in fact, a magic in incantation. Obscure homicidal forces lurk in our entrails. Deadly impulses to kill, destroy, hate, dishonor. The then art appears with its sweet piping and, and delivers us. I wrote 
pursued, struggled the whole day through. In the evening I was exhausted, but I felt I had made progress, had mastered a few advanced posts of the enemy. I was now anxious for Zodbat return, so that I could eat, sleep and build up my strength to, to resume the fight at dawn. It was already dark when Zodba came in. He had a radiant expression on, on his face. He, he has found the answer to something too, I thought, and I waited. I had begun to grow impatient with him and, only a few days before, I had said, said angrily, Zodba, our funds are getting low. Whatever has to be done, do it quickly. Let's get this railway going. If we're not successful with the coal, let, let's go all, all out for the timber. Otherwise, we've had it. Zodba had scratched his beard. Funds getting low, are they, boss? That's bad, he said. They're gone, Zodba. We, we've swallowed up the lot. Do something. How are you, your experiments going? No luck yet? Zodba had hung his head and made no reply. He had felt ashamed that, that evening. That damn slope, he said furiously. I'll get the better the, the better of it yet. And now he had come in, his face lit up with success. I've done it, boss, he shouted. I found the right angle. It was slipping through my hands, trying to get away from me, but I held on and pinned it down, boss. Well, hurry up and get the thing working. Fire away, Zorba. What else do you need? Early tomorrow morning, I, I must go to town and buy the tackle. A thick steel cable, pulleys, bearings, nails, hooks. Don't don't worry. I'll be back almost before you've seen me go. He lit the fire shortly afterwards, pre prepared our meal, and we ate and drank with ex with excellent appetites. We had both worked well that day. The next morning, I went with Zorba as far as the village. We talked like serious and practical-minded people about the working of of the lignite. While going down the slope, Zodbal kicked against the stone, which went rolling downhill. He stopped for a moment in amazement, as if he were seeing this astounding spectacle for the first time in his life. He looked around at me, and in his look I, I discerned faint consternation. Boss, did you see that? He said at last. On slopes, stones come to life again. I said nothing, but I felt a deep joy. This, I thought, is how great visionaries and poets see everything, as if for the first time, each morning they see a new world before their eyes. They do not really see it, they create it. The universe for, for Zodba, as for the first man of Earth, on Earth, was a weighty, intense vision. The stars glided over him, the sea broke against his temples. He lived the Earth, the water, the, the animals and God, without the distorting intervention of reason. Dame Hortense had, had been informed and she was waiting for us on her doorstep. She was painted, co cocked with powder and uneasy. She had got herself up like a funfair on a Saturday night. The mule was in front of her gate. Zorba jumped on its back and seized the reins. This old siren came up timidly and placed her plump little hand on the animal's breast, as if she wanted to prevent her beloved from leaving. Zodba, she cooed, raising herself on tiptoe. Zodba. Zodba turned his head away. He hated having to listen to lovers' nonsense, like this is, like this in the middle of the road. The poor woman saw his look and was terrified, but her hand still pressed on the mule's breast, full of tender entreaty. What do you want? Zodba asked angrily. Zodba, she pleaded, be good, don't forget me, Zodba, be good. Zodba shook the reins without replying. The mule started off. Good luck, Zodba, I cried. Three days, do you hear? No more. He turned round, waving his big hand. The old siren was weeping, and her tears washed furrows in the powder of her face. I gave you my word, boss, Zodba shouted. Goodbye. And he disappeared beneath the olive trees. Dame Hortense went on crying, but she kept her eyes on the splash of color made by the, gray, the gay red rug which she had placed so carefully for her beloved so that he should be comfortably seated. It was constantly be, being hidden by the silver foliage of the trees. Soon even that had disappeared. Dame Hortense looked round her. The world was empty. 
<clears throat> I did not go back to the beach. I felt sad and walked towards the mountains. As I reached the mountain track, I heard the trumpet sound. The country postman was announcing his arrival in the village. Master, he called to me, waving his hand. He came over and gave me a packet of new newspapers, some literary re reviews and two letters. One I immediately put away in my pocket to read in, in the evening, when the day is done and the spirit is calm. I knew who had written it, and I wanted to defer my joy so that it should last longer. The other letter I recognized from its sharp, jerky writing and the exotic stamps. It came from one of my old fellow students, Kalayanis. It was from a wild African mountainside near Tanganyika. He, had a, he was a strange, impulsive, dark man with very white teeth. One of his canines stuck out like a wild boar's. He never talked, he shouted, he never discussed, he quarreled. He had left his own country, Crete, where he, where he had been a young theology teacher and a monk. He had flirted with one of his students, and they had been, been surprised one day kissing out in the fields. They had been booed. The same day the young teacher threw off the cowl and took a boat. He went to an uncle in Africa and started to work with a will. He opened a rope factory and made a lot of money. From time to time he wrote to me and invited me to go and stay with him for six months. Whenever I opened one of his letters, even before I read it, I could feel arising from the crowded pages, which were always soon together with, a, with string, a violent breath which made my hair stand on end. I was always deciding I would go and see him in Africa, but never went. I left the track, sat on a stone, opened and began reading the letter. When are you going to make up your mind to come here to me, you damned, you damned limpet clamped to the rocks of Greece? You two have turned into a typical lousy Greek, a tavern loafer, a wallower in cafe li life. Because you need not think only cafes and cafes. Books are too, and habits, and your precious ideologies. They're all ca cafes. It is Sunday today and I have nothing to do. I am on my estate and I am thinking of you. The sun is like a furnace and there, and there has not been a drop of rain. Here when the rain f does fall in April, May and June, it's an absolute deluge. I I'm all alone and I like that. There are quite a lot of lousy Greeks here. Is there anywhere this vermin doesn't get, get to? But I don't want to mix with them. They, they disgust me. Even here, you damned tavern loafers, may the devil take you. You've sent us your le your leprosy, your miserable backbiting. That's what is ruining Greece. Politics. There's scar playing, too, of course, and ignorance, and the sins of the flesh. I detest e Europeans. That's why I am wandering about here in the mountains of Usumbara. I hate Europeans, but most of all, I hate the lousy Greeks and everything Greek. I'll never set foot in Greece again. This is where I'll finish up. I've had my tomb made already, in front of my hut, here on the wild mountainside. I've even put up a stone and myself carved these worlds in large capitals. Here lies a Greek who hates the Greeks. I burst out laughing, spit, swear and weep whenever I think of Greece. So as to see no Greeks and nothing Greek, I left the country forever. I came here, brought my destiny with me. It, it, it was not my destiny which brought me. Man does, does what he chooses. I brought my destiny here and I've worked and still am working like a slave. I've been sweating and will continue to sweat by the bucketful. I am fighting with the earth, the wind, the rain, and with the workmen, my red and black slaves. I have no pleasure. Yes, one. Work. Physical and mental, but preferably physical. I like to exhaust myself, sweat, hear my bones crack. Half my money I, th I throw away, waste it however and wh wh wherever I feel inclined. I'm not a slave to money. Money is my slave. I am a slave to work and I'm proud of it. I feel trees, I have a contract with the British, I make rope, and now I've started planting cotton too. Last night among my negroes, two tribes, the Waiyo and the Wangoni, began fighting over a woman, over a whore. 
just hurt pride, you know? Just the same as in Greece. Insults, brawls, and then out come the clubs. They broke one another's heads over her. The women ran to fetch me in the middle of the night and woke me with their yapping to go and arbitrate. I was angry, told them all to, to go to the devil, then to the British police. But they stayed there howling in front of my door the whole night. At dawn I went out and, and arbitrated. Tomorrow early I am going to start the Uzumbala Mountains. To scale the Uzumbala Mountains with their, with their dense forest, fresh waters and everlasting greenness. Well, you lousy Babylonian Greek, when will you cut adrift from Europe? that great horde that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. When will you come come so that we can climb these pure and wild mountains together? I have a child by a black woman, a girl. I've sent her mother away. She cuckled at me in public in, in the full glare of the, of the midday sun, under every green tree in the neighborhood. I had enough of her and threw her out. But I kept the the girl. She's two. She can walk and she's beginning to talk. I'm teaching her Greek. The first sentence I taught her was, I spit on you, you lousy Greeks. I spit on you, you lousy Greeks. She looks like me, the little scamp. She's only got her mother's bro broad flat nose. I love her, but just as you love a dog or a cat. Come out here and get a boy by a uh, Uzumbala woman. We'll marry the two of them one day, just to amuse ourselves and to amuse them too. Goodbye, may the devil go with you and with me, dear friend. Kadayanis servus diabolicus dei. I left the letter open on my knees. An ardent desire to go took possession of me once more. Not because I wanted to leave, I was quite alright on this Cretan coast, and felt happy and free there there and I needed nothing, but because I have always been consumed with, with one desire. To touch and see as much as possible on of the earth and the sea before I die. I stood up, changed my mind, and instead of climbing the hill, went hurriedly towards the beach. I felt the other letter in the upper pocket of my coat, and could not wait any more. That sweet, unbearable foretaste of joy had lasted long enough. I reached the hut, lit the fire, made some tea, ate some bread and honey and oranges. I undressed, stretched out on my bed and opened the letter. Master and Neophyte, greeting. I have a tremendous and difficult job here, thank God. I enclosed a dangerous word in invested, inverted commas, like a wild beast behind bars. So that you do not get excited as soon as you open my letter. Well, a very difficult job, God be praised. Half a million Greeks are in danger in the south of Russia and the Caucasus. Many of them speak only Turkish or Russian, but their hearts speak Greek fanatically. They are of our race. Just to look th at them, the way they, their eyes flash, r rapacious, ferrety, the cunning and sen the cunning and sensuality of their lips when they smile, the way they have managed to become bosses and have mujiks working for them in this immense territory of Russia. It's quite enough to convince you that there are descendants of our, your beloved Odysseus. So one comes to love them and cannot let them perish. For they are in danger of perishing. They have lost all they had, are, ha are hungry and naked. For from one side they are harried by the Bolsheviks, from the one from the other by the Kurds. Refugees have swarmed in every direction to settle in one town or another in Georgia or, or Armenia. There's no food, medicine or clothing. They gather in the ports, scan the ho horizon anxiously for Greek sheep ships coming to take them back to their mother, Greece. One part of our race, that means one part of our soul, is panic-stricken. If we leave them to their fate, they will perish. We need a lot of love and understanding, enthusiasm and practical sense, those qualities which you like so much to see united. If we are going to save them and get them back to the part of our own free land, where they will be of most of use. That is, on the frontiers of Macedonia, and, further afield, on the frontiers of Thrace. 
That is the only way I we shall have saved hundreds of thousands of Greeks and save ourselves with them. For as soon as I arrived here, I drew a circle in the way you taught me and called that circle my duty. I said, if I save this entire circle, I am saved. If I do not save it, I am lost. Well, inside that circle, there are 500,000 Greeks. I go to towns and villages, collect all the Greeks together, write reports, send telegrams, try to make our officials in, in Athens send boats, food, clothes, and medicine, and transport these poor creatures to Greece. If, 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 to, tr if to struggle with zeal and, and obstinacy is to be happy, then I am happy. I do not know whether I have cut my happiness to my stature, to use your phrase. Please have an I have, because then I would be a great person. I would like to increase my stature so that to that I think to what I think would make me happy, that is to the farthest frontiers of Greece. But that's enough theory. You are lying on on your Cretan beach, listening to the sound of the sea and the santuri. You, you have time, I have not. I am swallowed up by activity and I am glad of it. Action, dear, dear and active master, action. There is no other salvation. The subject of my meditations is, in fact, very simple and all of a piece. I say, these inhabitants of the Pontus and the Caucasus, peasants of cars, Big and small merchants of Tiflis, Batum, Novorossik, Rostov, Odessa, and the Crimea are ours and are not and are of are of our blood. For them, as for us, the capital of Greece is Constantinople. We all have the same chief. You call him Odysseus. Others, Con Constantinos Palologos. Not the uh, not the one who was killed beneath the walls of Byzantium. But the other, the legendary one, who was changed into marble and still stands erect, waiting for the Angel of Liberty. With your permission, I call this chief of our race, Akritas. I like the, the name better. It is more austere and warlike. As soon as you hear it, there rises within you the image of the eternal Helen, fully armed, fighting without cease or respite on the boundaries and frontiers. On every frontier, national intellectual and spiritual. And if you add Diogenes, you describe even more completely that marvelous synthesis of East and West, which is our race. I am in Cardas now. I have to assemble all, all the Greeks and of the neighbor, neighboring villages. On the day of my arrival, the, the Kurds had seized a Greek teacher and priest in, in the district and nailed horseshoes to, his, to their feet. The, the notables were horrified and took refuge in the house where, I, where I'm staying. We can hear the Kurds' guns coming closer all the time. All these Greeks have their eyes fixed on me, as if I were the only one with the strength to, to save them. I, I was counting on leaving tomorrow for Tiflis, but now in the face of this danger I'm ashamed to leave. So I am staying. I don't say I am not afraid, I am afraid, but I am ashamed. Wouldn't Rembrandt's warrior, my warrior, have done the same thing? He would have stayed. So I am staying too. If the Kurds come to the town, it is only natural and just that I should be the first to, sh to be shooed. I am sure, master, you never thought your pupil would end like this. After one of the, those interminable Greek dis discussions, we decided that everyone should assemble th this evening with mules, horses, cattle, women, and children, and at dawn we, we, will, we will start out together for the north. I shall walk in front, the ram guiding the flock. Uh, a patriarchal uh, immigration of a people over chains of mountains and plains with legendary names, and I shall be a sort of Moses, an, an imitation Moses, leading the chosen race to the promised land. As these na naive people are calling Greece. Of course, to be really worthy of this mosaic mission, and not, to, not disgrace you, I should have done away with my elegant leggings, which you tease me about and wrap my legs in sheepskin. I should also have a long, greasy, wavy beard, and above all, a large pair of horns. 
But I'm sorry, I can't give you that pleasure. It's easier to get me to change my soul than my costume. I wear leggings, I am as smooth shaven as a cabbage stump, and I'm not married. <coughs> <coughs> Master, I hope you get this letter, for it may be the last. No one can say. I have no confidence in the secret forces which are said to protect man. I believe in the blind forces which hit out right and left, without malice, without purpose, killing whoever happens to be in their way. If I leave this earth, I say leave so as not to frighten you or myself with the proper word. If I leave this earth, I say, I hope you keep well and happy, dear master. I'm embarrassed at having to say it, but I must, so please excuse me. I too have loved you very dearly. Then underneath, written hurriedly in pencil, was this postscriptum. P.S. I haven't forgotten the, the agreement we made on the boat the day I left. If I have to leave this earth, I shall warn you, remember. Whenever, wherever you are, don't let it scare you.